Pst. As we've already said, the uh, Committee on Climate Change was set up in the Climate Change Act to give independent advice to the government and to report to Parliament on, uh, in terms of adaptation, you know, progress in preparing for climate change. On the screen here are the members of the committee who uh, cover a range of dif different disciplines uh, in terms of science, economics, engineering, uh, and we have a health practitioner science as well. So a range of different disciplines to provide our two key roles. And the progress report that we published at the end of June was the first opportunity for the committee to present to Parliament its statutory advice and, and, and a statutory report on the progress being made towards uh, adapting to climate change. Uh, the adaptation policy cycle obviously is set out under the Climate Change Act and this just gives a quick overview of where we are. Essentially we're at that milestone where we're presenting our first statutory report on the National Adaptation Programme responding to the uh, National Adaptation National Adaptation Programme that was published by the government in the summer of 2013. From this point onwards, we'll be reporting every other year. So the Climate Change Act says that every two years we need to present a statutory report. Um, and the, uh, obviously we expect the next National Adaptation Programme due in 2018 to take account of the advice that we've been given, uh, been given giving over previous years in the form of non-statutory progress reports and obviously in terms of the 36 specific recommendations we make in this first statutory report. It's also worth noting that we've been asked to uh, prepare the next uh, evidence report to feed into the second UK climate change risk assessment. So we have a statutory role under the Act to give advice on the climate change risk assessment and this time round we're giving that advice in the form of an evidence report which will run to several hundred pages and compile the latest assessment of climate science and the potential impacts for the UK uh, in, in the built environment, natural environment and all the other kind of uh, chapters that obviously we'll be, we'll be uh, writing and reporting on next year. In terms of the National Adaptation Programme itself, obviously it was the first time, first of all, that this has been done and we have to recognise that the UK is almost unique in having a statutory framework in place, a legal requirement for the government both to reduce carbon emissions and also to prepare a programme that will adapt the country to climate change. And the first programme, uh, first NAP published in 2013, was a comprehensive document, a comprehensive assessment of the actions that, are, that were being taken at the time to adapt the country to climate change. Within the report we have 31 objectives set by the government and a range of actions being taken forward by lots of different people, lots of different organisations with an important part to play in adapting the country. 371 actions in total and this chart shows that when we look at those actions and we look at the reports that have been provided by the people who are responsible for their delivery, uh, over 100, 100 or so actions are already complete and most of the remains are, are on track to be delivered. Only a very few actions were either have been revised or delayed or dropped and of course that's a very positive picture reflecting how much activity is underway including by many of the people who are online and taking part in this web conference today. So the committee were very keen to, to recognise and to welcome the amount of activity that has been taking place. But we do recognise that within those actions that are uh, classified as on track by their owners, uh, more than half of them have no fixed deadline, more than half of them don't have a kind of specific deliverable in mind. So whilst the actions have been complete, many actions are complete, the picture may not change that much, I guess, between now and our next report in two years' time if, there, if these actions aren't particularly well kind of defined. So from a, a terms of a progress, in terms of action delivery, certainly there's a positive picture. But the committee didn't want to leave it there because we could have all the action in the world, lots of people taking lots of, um, you know, putting in lots of effort, but that doesn't necessarily mean that climate change risks are reducing and that the vulnerability to climate change impacts is, is falling. So the committee wants to ask three questions in each of the areas that the National Adaptation Programme looks at. So on this chart, down the kind of left-hand side on the kind of y-axis, you have the themes that were set out in the National Adaptation Programme. And our assessment, our evaluation of the NAP follows the same themes for, for kind of ease of reference. But across the top, across the columns, uh, 
this chart presents the, the main questions that we ask in each individual area. The middle column covers those actions which I've just talked about, showing that in most cases, the actions are either on track or they're even complete or ready. And we're not really concerned about the actions that have been taking place. But the, but the wider questions are almost more important. First of all, is there a plan? Is there a policy framework in place that takes account of climate change impacts and helps to address vulnerabilities over time? So the first column asks, is there a policy that explicitly takes account of climate change and builds in sensible decision making over time so that progress should be made. And again, in most, care, most areas we found you know, positive policies and programs that do mention climate change, do factor in climate change, build in allowances for climate change within the policies like the National Policy national plan, uh, planning policy framework or the national policy statements when it comes to infrastructure for example uh, the heat wave plan within the health sector that obviously recognizes the increasing incidence of heat waves um, but again that doesn't necessarily mean that vulnerabilities are falling so our third question in the last area could I ask a member of the team to find a power source before my laptop dies um, the last question <laughs> Is, is almost the most important, which says, you know, on the basis of the actions taking place, on the basis of the wider trends in vulnerability to do with the growing aging population, for example, changes in the economy, changes in land use, which somebody mentioned this morning, you know, do we factor in land use change into our assessment? Certainly on the adaptation side, we do very much so because we recognize that climate change is an additional stressor to problems that are already being caused by other wider factors. So we do take those into account in our last question, which is about you know, taking all the range of factors into account, including climate change. Are we seeing indicators of vulnerability moving in the right direction? And that's a much more of a, a kind of mixed picture. And in fact, there are very few areas where we think that indicators are moving in, direct, in, the, direction, in the right direction and actually quite a few areas, about six in total, which I'll talk about more in a moment, where indicators are moving in the wrong direction despite all the efforts going in. So we don't want to diminish the importance of the activity that's taking place, but we have to recognize that with, with the additional pressures being brought to bear on aspects of the, uh, of, of the economy, that more needs to be done if we are to see vulnerabilities reducing over time. And across the report, the, uh, the Committee on Climate Change wanted to stress four, four main areas, four main areas which kind of cut across all the chapters to a degree, and that if the government does nothing else in the coming years, in its response to our report in October, it needs to have a coherent and ambitious plan to address these four core, core issues. The first is about water scarcity, uh, and similarly you know, on the other, other side of the kind of water cycle in terms of flooding. Uh, heat stress, which obviously we've had heat, um, heat waves most, you know, quite, quite recently in the last couple of weeks, and also in terms of impacts on natural capital and agriculture. And again, in all of these areas, there is action taking place, but the, this, the scale of the challenge is such that the progress that is being made needs at the very least to be maintained and continued over the course of many years and decades. And I was uh, outlining the four main areas of climate change risk that the committee wants to uh, reinforce and uh, put forward as the priorities for the government for the next few years in terms of their uh, initial response to our progress report in October and any further work and activity they want to pursue in terms of climate change adaptation in the coming years. So we've talked about water scarcity and flooding uh, heat stress and impacts on natural capital and agriculture. And in all of these areas, there clearly is activity happening. There are policies in place to address these risks. And the question is whether over time they are sufficiently ambitious to address challenges and the scale of the climate change projections that the science suggests could well uh, uh, unfold in the coming years. So in terms of water scarcity, certainly there has been progress, that, as we'll uh, talk about later in the built environment chapter, that uh, water demand by uh, households and actually by businesses and even uh, within agriculture uh, or those 
indicators of water use are moving in the right direction. Uh, there's increasing penetration and metering, but the scale of the climate change projection, certainly when you get into the higher emission scenarios, are such that there could well be a gap between the amount of water available and the demand for water water in a, in a dry year that is as big as the total amount of water used for agriculture, currently about 120 billion litres per year. In terms of flood risk, again, there's lots to progress in terms of uh, capital investment going in, a six-year investment plan, uh, 1,400 flood defence schemes being taken, uh, taken forward across the country, but still, even in the context of that, we expect to see more and more homes falling into the highest flood risk category in the coming decades, even if there is no new house building in the floodplain, which is again a topic we'll, we'll turn to later. In terms of heat stress, there are plans in place to manage the, the emergencies uh, and the immediate health impacts of a heat wave through the uh, National Heat Wave Plan. But as yet, we've not begun to adapt the built environment so that people can be uh, safe and comfortable in hotter weather. Uh, it's not just in terms of energy efficiency, but also in terms of um, solar gain and heat stress, where our built environment is not yet uh, well prepared for the hotter summers we can expect in, in future decades. And lastly, across natural capital and agriculture, we see uh, many indicators of environmental quality moving in the wrong direction. Uh, sustained pressure from a number of sources to do with uh, water availability, water, uh, water quality, um, the organic uh, carbon content, content of our soils, uh, soil erosion. Uh, so a range of different pressures on agriculture and on biodiversity, which means that in indicators around uh, biodiversity in the farmed countryside are moving in the wrong direction. And as yet, we are likely to, to miss uh, the government's own goals for uh, the biodiversity you know, contained within the Biodiversity 2020 strategy. So four main areas for the government to consider in taking forward climate change adaptation. But we wanted to delve down below that, those headline messages into uh, specific areas within, within each of the national adaptation programs themes where we think more effort is required. And so what we did, uh, and you'll find this chart in the executive summary to both, it's both in terms of volume one, the joint mitigation adaptation progress report, and in the executive summary of the adaptation progress report, is a chart which overlays whether or not there is a plan which goes across the top of the chart in terms of the columns, and also whether or not uh, progress is being made in terms of vulnerability, both in terms of red, amber, green. Uh, this is the kind of first and the third column of the, uh, the kind of uh, red, amber, green chart you saw a few moments ago. And if you look for those policy areas, those adaptation priorities where uh, plans are not yet fully mature in terms of addressing climate change, and also where the indicators of vulnerability are not yet moving in the right direction, uh, you get yourself towards the kind of top left-hand side of this chart, and it's in those areas where we want the, the, uh, the government to focus most uh, first. We also recognise there are some areas, five areas in the bottom row of this chart, where indicators of vulnerability are actually moving in the right direction. I've already mentioned a few of those in terms of water use in the built environment. Uh, this probably is too small to read on your screen, but just to recognise you know, some of the areas where progress is being made, we think in terms of water demand by industry, so um, Water use by uh, for water use for industry in terms of chemicals, uh, paper manufacturing, mining and quarrying. You know, water demand is falling. Uh, that's in part for the same reason why uh, carbon emissions are falling within industry, and it's because of the change in the manufacturing base within this country. A heavy industry moving abroad, being replaced by a more of a service-based um, economy. Uh, which doesn't use as much water. But nevertheless, if we're looking at uh, vulnerability to climate change impacts and the impacts of years of water scarcity, then certainly having indicators uh, showing reduced demand for water is obviously a positive thing. Water demand in the built environment is also uh, moving in the right direction. We're also seeing um, trees being planted in certainly in managed forests. Uh, more suitable for the changing climate, a more diverse range of trees being planted. We're also seeing the ecological condition of coastal habitats improve. And lastly, uh, within the infrastructure sector, 
we're seeing the energy networks uh, in terms of the distribution companies and the transmission companies investing in the resilience of their networks that, so that dur during periods of severe weather, uh, electricity should still be, uh, be able to supply to the majority of customers. There will still be outages as they were you know, in 2013, 2014, but in terms of the likelihood of severe impacts, then certainly that probability is, is reducing. But to turn to the six areas across the top of the chart where we, we find that vulnerability uh, appears to be still increasing despite the activity going on, uh, this is the list, list here. And again, it's, it's in the report. And I'll just cover them very briefly because we'll talk about each of these in turn when we get into the individual chapters. But the, the, the only area uh, within our assessment where we think both that vulnerability is increasing in terms of the number of uh, homes in the highest risk uh, areas of the country uh, where flood risks are greater than 1 in 30, uh, 1 in 30 annual chance or greater, where the number of homes in that category is likely to increase. And whilst there's also a lack of policy or a plan to address that risk is in that top area in terms of residual flood risk to, to existing properties. So we're saying at the community scale, there is a lot going on. There's a the six year investment plan, uh, lots of schemes being built to protect kind of primarily urban areas, um, where obviously the benefits of protection are greatest. But at the same time, we expect the number of uh, properties in the highest flood risk category to increase by about 45,000 between now and the 2060s. And as yet, the government hasn't got an approach to, to address that. Essentially, most of the uh, kind of national flood strategy is focused on protecting communities, understanding flood risk, and then being able to respond when uh, flood alerts are issued and flood, uh, flooding takes place. There's a gap in the strategy, essentially, which is about managing residual risk, managing risk at the individual property level so that people can be back in their homes sooner, that we have less uh, insured and uninsured flood damage across the country. So if there's, there's, if there's no area that the government, you know, if there's only one area that the government addresses, then certainly that's, that's one where we'd like to see more action. The next three are areas where there certainly is at least some plan to address vulnerability, but still indicators of vulnerability are, are, are deteriorating, and that's to do with health-related uh, impacts during heat waves in terms of fertility of agricultural spoils and the e ecological condition of farm countryside. The last two are areas where there are plans, uh, certainly in terms of surface water flood management, we have the PIT review, which uh, initiated a range of different activity, including the Flood Water Management Act, which created more responsibility for local authorities to manage uh, all sorts of flood risk within their area, particularly in terms of surface water. But as yet, progress by local authorities has been slow, uh, that at least um, half of all local authorities have yet to have developed a local flood risk management strategy, which has been a statutory requirement for the last five years. So there certainly is a plan, but as yet implementation isn't yet at the stage where vulnerabilities are falling. Uh, we've also seen uh, a weakening to proposals to require sustainable urban drainage systems within uh, new development, and also a very low to take up of uh, permeable paving options, uh, you know, impermeable surfacing, whether it's tarmac or concrete blocks, is still the norm. It's still making up more than 90% of projects according to data we collected last year. And the last area where, again, there are, there's a strategy to address um, the ecological condition of wetland habitats, like other types of natural habitats, but as yet, we've yet to see the level of progress which we need, particularly in terms of peat and um, we've observed damaging practices which damage the peat and affect the, the fertility of soils. Um, that, that's certainly a concern and um, there are damaging practices still continuing, particularly in upland areas where uh, the growth in kind of grouse shooting and production of grouse has increased over the last decade or so and um, burning of heather to produce, so burning of peat to produce heather it, it has been continuing and is, uh, has the consent of Natural England in some cases. So those are the six areas where we want to highlight particular, a particular level of urgency that the government should address. Uh, we make a series of recommendations, but perhaps we'll come back to those later. Uh, but we also found a, a lack of evidence in some areas to tell us whether or not uh, progress is being made and vulnerabilities are reducing. And it's worth just 
accepting that there are data gaps, we recognise those, and we're very much uh, you know, keen and willing to work with people to help fill those gaps in the next couple of years before we come to publish our next report in two years' time. And those gaps are relating to uh, ports and airports as commercial operations. We don't know enough about what they're doing to protect, uh, protect those sites and also recognise that there have been impacts in recent years. For example, the port of Immigham that had to close in the tidal surge in December 2013, and Gatwick Airport, which suffered severe disruption on Christmas Eve of 2013 because of the severe weather that Christmas. Uh, digital infrastructure, which is about obviously IT, telecommunications, data uh, storage, application server sites. Uh, we don't know enough yet about what they're doing, but they are producing an adaptation report under the adaptation reporting power uh, this year. Uh, which of course we very much welcome. We don't know yet enough about pathogens, air pollution, and UV radiation, how uh, those uh, perils will change and be influenced by the climate and how that might play out in the healthcare system. We also don't know enough about uh, three other aspects of the health, uh, health sector in terms of the resilience of the health and social care system itself to climate change impacts and whether or not we have the emergency planning uh, system and the capability in place to respond to the increasing incidence of severe weather we can expect in future. And also we don't know enough about people's ability to recover from flooding and whether or not there are plans now in place that help people get uh, help people get back in their homes more quickly, but also manage the long-term kind of health and well-being consequences of being flooded. We know it takes a long time uh, physically to recover, but longer probably for, men, uh, for people to recover uh, mentally. Uh, that we do recognise there is now a kind of cohort study being uh, launched by Public Health England to better understand the, the impacts in that area. And lastly, we don't know enough about agriculture and forestry pests and diseases. We know that there has been increasing incidence of kind of invasive species and uh, tree diseases, but that's probably driven by uh, globalisation and global trade. We don't know enough yet about how climate change will affect the, um, yeah, the, the incidence of invasive species in this country. So that's a quick overview. Uh, I recognise I've probably gone on a little bit longer than I should in terms of the uh, overview, but just want to leave you at this stage with the key messages. First of all, we'll talk in a moment about the National Adaptation Programme itself. Uh, that we think it should be a more strategic focus document focusing on those four main areas that we highlighted a moment ago. And we also recognise in those four areas there is some progress, but certainly scope for more investment, more effort, more activity that addresses the, the specific risks that uh, we have identified and addresses specific policy gaps where we have found them. So if I pause for questions at this stage, I think we can probably catch up a little bit in the next session, so I'm not too concerned that I've run on a little bit longer than I should have. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that as well as our progress report, which is the, say the, the green cover, if you look on the uh, website uh, and scroll down the web page which has the reports on it, you'll find a series of what we're calling dashboards, but they're kind of technical annexes to each of the chapters within the report, and they contain the evidence upon which we've made our assessment. So there's a series of uh, indicators together with trend information where we have it, and an implication, so again, a red, amber, green about that particular data set. So just to give a few examples, uh, here's one which looks at surface water flood management, the indicators of vulnerability to do with surface water management. So this is one looking at sales of permeable paving, which uh, you know, permeable paving is on the rise, but certainly as a proportion of total block paving sales, it's a very small proportion. So it's going in the right direction, but not at a very uh, particularly speedy pace. Uh, and similarly, indicators of impacts as well, where we've got them available. So this is a, uh, a snapshot of the number of homes affected by sewer flooding in recent years. So we can monitor over time whether or not the trends in sewer flooding are going in a, in a positive direction or not. Um, we publish those dashboards to show where we've got to. You know, they are, they're a work in progress. We want to update them over time. We want to extend them where people have data that tells us something interesting about these different topics. So if people have can read the pack and recognize there are different data sets available, then please do come forward and let us know about those. And we'll be updating those as we go forward in terms of um, being able to report again in two years' time. Uh, we'll talk about loss of urban green space when we get to the built environment chapter. Uh, but also the linkages between adaptation and mitigation are really important. There are certain areas where it makes sense 
from both a carbon reduction perspective and in terms of a climate impacts perspective to take action. The built environment about land use, about uh, soils and farming and upland peat are areas where you can do things that uh, tick a number of different boxes at the same time. And we also recognize within the built environment when you're improving the energy efficiency and the, the heat retention of our building stock, you could, uh, as a consequence, make them more prone to overheating in the summer. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. It's just if you blindly improve energy efficiency at all costs without thinking about the wider impacts uh, during the summer months. And there's certainly measures you can take to improve the thermal efficiency in the house, of the housing stock, but also mean that it releases heat in the, in the summer months. Uh, we talked about uh, the adaptation of reporting power and ports and airports. And I guess our general perspective on the adaptation of reporting power is that it's a very useful process. Uh, it's great that so many companies and uh, infrastructure organizations reported as part of the first round, and yeah, many are due to report again. Uh, but our general view is that they, they lack quantitative evidence that they present uh, good and worthy principles and high-level statements, but they lack uh, quantitative evidence that allows us to assess over time what's actually happening. So everyone can point to a great case study of saying that something that, that has uh, been done that's obviously good and positive, but what we try to do is sit back and say at scale, at the national scale, is enough being done? Are, there, are we doing things at the scale of magnitude that we need to address these, these trends over time? Um, and there are a couple of other questions about the planning system, which no doubt we'll come back to, and also about how we engage with the general public. You know, does, does the general public know about climate change and know about the risks of climate change? And again, I don't want to uh, steal Catherine's thunder when we talk about uh, the, uh, the health, healthy and resilient communities chapter. So I think at that point, if people are happy, we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, chapter. We'll pick up these other questions if we can as we go along. And first, I'll hand over to David Thompson, who's going to give us a few, um, few minutes just on the National Adaptation Programme itself.